Hi, and welcome to Ask for Science. And since this video began, there have been born approximately 78 new people on this planet. And around 32 have died, so the difference is 46 people. In other words, the world population has increased by 46 people. Well, now it's 92. In November 2022, the world population reached 8 billion people. When this video was done, there were 8,007,095,000 people on this planet. To give you an idea, if each person was a year, together we would add up to a little more than half the age of the universe. Listening to these figures, the first thing that one wonders is if this amount of people is really a lot of people or few people. Let's put it into perspective. The worldometers.info website offers live the approximate amount of people in this exact moment. It also allows you to see all the people on the planet in one single page, from first to last. Look, that was you. Seen this way, it may seem like we're a lot. If all the people on the planet came together to the same place and understanding that in a square meter about 10 people fit, all of humanity would fit in the city of New York. And if we piled up on top of each other, making a kind of human cube, we would all fit in this blue cube. The two buildings that are next to it are the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world, and the Empire State Building. There's still a lot of space left on Earth. With no doubt, this is something very difficult to do, not to say impossible, but it helps us to see there were really not that many. Or what would happen if all humanity held hands and made a big circle? Well, that we wouldn't fit on Earth. In fact, as you see in this image, we would be much further than the orbit of the moon. This is not working. Depending on how we organize ourselves, there's either too much space left or we don't fit in this planet. But we're never gonna all get inside a cube nor make a big circle. What is it that's going to limit how much people live on Earth? It will not be space, even though the growth figures of populations are overwhelming and they can make you think that every time it increases faster, they lead to a wrong idea. Since 1963, the growth rate has been slowing down. This means that each year, although the population increases, it does it more and more slowly. And it is believed that at some point of our lives, it will stop doing it to start decreasing. This means that there will be less and less people on the planet. But why will this happen? Surely, you're sick of hearing that the Earth is a planet with limited resources. Every single one of us consumes daily energy, food, water. But in reality, these resources are not renewable, so this represents a problem. But it will not be the lack of these resources what will limit the growth of population. What will it be then? Let's answer it with another question. Why is the population growth rate reducing? There is a theory called demographic transition theory that could explain the reason for this phenomenon that we're currently experiencing. And this theory at the moment is being fulfilled perfectly. It is very complex, but broadly, it predicts that the passage of a pre-industrial society with high mortality and birth rates towards a post-industrial society implies a decline of both birth and mortality rates. Much fewer people die, but also much fewer people are born. It's very likely that you live in a country where it is normal to have a child. Two, three, but more than four will probably sound strange to you, but it is something that was not unusual for your grandparents. How many siblings do your parents have, for example? Surely they have more than you. Another example can be found in developing countries, where until recently there were many children per couple, but this is starting to change. For example, in countries like India and the many of the African continent, slowly the rates are getting more similar to developed countries. This is why it is called a global trend. Is that true? Or is this theory a simple speculation with no arguments? Let's look at the demographic data of one of the most developed countries. That is, one of the countries which is more advanced in the graph predicted by the demographic transition theory. Sweden. As you can see, the behavior of the rates is quite similar to the graph corresponding to the theory. But let's see that graph again. If you look at the pink line of the rate of birth, it begins to noticeably decline once the so-called phase 5 is reached. But what is phase 5? Well, the rate that some countries such as many of the European Union have reached. The moment in which the birth rate continues to experience a decline to a point where it reaches below the mortality rate, with which the population growth becomes negative reducing population. According to the predictions of the demographic transition theory, in a couple decades, most of the countries would have reached phase 5. And in the long term, speaking on the order of centuries, we could literally be talking about the extinction of humanity. 
This can seem like an outrageous idea, but sadly, it comes out of making a few simple mathematical calculations. According to a study made by the prestigious institution IIASA that was made before the economic crisis of 2008 that made the situation worse, if the world stabilized at a birth rate of 1.5, that is to say that on average any woman in the world had 1.5 children, the rate that Europe has right now, by 2200 the population would be cut in half of what it is today. By 2300 it would hardly touch the billion. If this trend continues to extend over time, within 12 generations the entire world population would fit in an asylum. But why this trend? What makes the most likely future for humanity its own colossal decline? Well, it is because of education. I know that you might be a bit confused, but pay attention to the following. One of the first things that countries should do when they are beginning to develop is to educate young people. This is a great thing that dramatically improves the quality of life of the people who live in that country. In fact, thanks to education, we can be as well as we are, but in the same way an opportunity cost is created to have babies. What do I mean by opportunity cost? Well, basically, in order to have babies, first, it's necessary for the couple to have the opportunity to have them. Imagine the case of an architect who marries a particle physicist. These people are going to have their working life and their private life. However, unlike many years ago, these people are going to have their working life much more present in their day-to-day. -day. That is, the architect, for example, is going to want to build a monument in the center of the square of their town or city. And the particle physicist, who knows, maybe wants to discover a new particle. This is going to make these people, until they don't achieve their professional goals, to not stop thinking about these goals. Yes, they are going to have their private life, but they are going to be constantly thinking about their professional future. That is, they are going to be thinking about their professional life. What do I want to say with this? That the moment when they stop to think about whether they want to have babies will arrive very late. That is, when they will already be very old and it will surely be when they have a stable economic situation and have achieved what they wanted in their lives. At this point it may be that even if they can have babies, they won't have them. Lately, this is a phenomenon that is becoming more frequent in families. This is what I meant by opportunity cost. Even if they have it, they may decide not to do it. They might not want to. Having children is something that requires a lot of time, which before was superior. Given that, for example, many women didn't work. Obviously, I'm not saying that it is bad for women to work, or that education is not necessary. Quite the contrary, it is fantastic. This is what is allowing us to take the next step as a society. However, it has been shown that the more studies a woman has, the fewer children she has. The same happens with men. With this, what I want you to think and analyze is that how many siblings do you have compared to how many your parents have, and your grandparents, and so on. This way of life may be for the Homo sapiens what the giant asteroid was for the dinosaurs. If the humanity wants to sustain itself, the number of couples that have three or four children will have to exceed the number of couples that have one or none. How many siblings do you have? One? Two? It's not enough. Although indisputably, we cannot force anyone to have children, but two are simply not enough. Are we being selfish or simply rational? Our decision will be something for which our future generations will judge us, assuming that they get to exist. Okay, well this is very depressing. It is a big and very serious problem. Fortunately, there are countries that could have the solution. A remote community in the North Atlantic seems to have it all figured out. While it is at the top of the list in Europe, in terms of birth rate, Iceland is also pioneer in which refers to women's participation in the working life. At the same time, Iceland has the lowest unemployment rate for both women and men. And how is this possible? This is how Iceland works. Mothers and fathers from Iceland are entitled to nine months of leave for maternity or paternity. Of these nine months, three are for the father, three are for the mother, and three are for free choice. What this does is that many more people decide to have children, and also makes it possible for children to spend equal amounts of time with their parents. And it works very well. According to the data, around 80% of Icelandic parents enjoy their maternity or paternity leaves. In this way, both women and men can unite family and work. Even more so, from the point of view of the employer, hiring a woman is as risky as hiring a man of childbearing age. Something that greatly promotes gender equality. Something surprising is also the youth unemployment rate. In this country, it is only around 3%. In Spain, it's 50%. And not only that, in Iceland, women receive subsidies for having children. So it's normal to see young people of 21 and 22 who are studying at the university who are already pregnant. 
This is because they don't see motherhood as something that will come at a later age or at the middle of their life, and that at best it's only an option to be contemplated, but rather they see it as something obviously optional but that they can do at an early age, and this is working very well for this country. We're talking about the country with the highest birth rate in all of Europe and with the highest percentage of women working outside the home. That seems ideal. But what price are the Icelanders paying for the luxury of being able to produce so many new citizens? Well, once again, their statistics are staggering. In relative terms, Iceland concedes a considerably higher share of its gross domestic product for the benefit of the child and the family than the average of the European Union. However, the good and correct management of this country has allowed it to be number 14th on the planet in terms of gross domestic product per capita and third in human development index. And we're talking about an isolated country whose economy basically depends on fishing and aluminum. It's a lesson that humanity as a whole must learn to save itself. Let's be optimistic. Let's imagine that in the near future we're able to fix the problem of management and social organization and that we're able to stabilize the birth rate. Would this mean that humanity is already saved? Obviously not. Let's go back to the beginning of the video about the limited resources that the Earth can offer us. We could think that when the water available for humanity runs out, its growth will stop as well. So for that then, we need to know how many water is available. Well, here it is. The large sphere represents all the water on the planet, the medium one represents the fresh water, and the small one, the fresh water to which humanity has access to, since it can be found in lakes, rivers, and reservoirs. The smallest sphere has a volume of 235 cubic kilometers. These are the available freshwater reserves in the world. But we are 8 billion, 7 million, and 95,000 people on this planet who drink water every day. To be more specific, about 2 liters of water a day. Making calculations, it turns out that 0.01 cubic kilometers of water are consumed every day. Is this too much for the planet? Well, if we take into account that every day it drains 293 cubic kilometers of water on Earth, we can firmly say that it's not. Obviously, it doesn't rain the same in all areas of the planet or in all countries. Water is not very well distributed, but there are areas where it drains a lot, so water will not be the limiting factor. The limiting factor will be the number of vegetarians that there are. Why? Let me explain. Currently, it is estimated that there are approximately 1.4 billion hectares of arable land on the planet. If all these lands were used for vegetables, up to 10 billion people could be fed. But there is a problem. Cattle or meat consumes a lot of vegetables, which makes the number of people reduced considerably, because cattle requires four times more land than vegetables. If the population continues to be omnivores, we will never be able to reach 10 billion. Look, even being optimistic and imagining that the entire population is going to become vegetarian, which is never going to happen, we only get 10 billion people. These are only 2 billion people more than there are currently, and it's a much smaller figure than one might imagine initially. However, it is very important to note that we have not had in this analysis other factors such as the climate change, which could greatly decimate this figure. But there may also be other factors that can increase it, such as a future in which humanity invents a way to gain arable lands by building, for example, underground facilities with artificial light as they have done experimentally in the United Kingdom. So, although it is very difficult to accurately specify the maximum number of people that can fit in this planet, we could put an approximate figure of 10 billion people. But is this a lot of people or a few people? Let's put it into perspective. It is estimated that during the entire history of humanity, 100 billion people have existed in this planet. So that is to say that the current number of people alive does not represent more than 10% of the total number of humans who have ever inhabited planet Earth. A curious coincidence since this is approximately the number of stars that are in the Milky Way. So we can say that for every human being that has existed, a star shines in the sky. It may be that in the future we will be safe from the problem of population decline and the lack of food. In that case, the population will continue to increase, but we won't fit in this planet. Earth is our spaceship with limited capacity. To continue to exist, we just have to learn to reach those stars that represent those who have already left. Thank you very much for watching the video, and goodbye.